We turn again this evening to the book of Daniel and to the third chapter. Last Sunday evening we were looking at the closing verses of chapter 2 and the first seven verses of chapter 3. And we saw how time unmasked the confession of faith of King Nebuchadnezzar as being unreal, insincere, superficial. His profession of faith seems so glowing, and yet as the time passed, not least with the building of this golden image, he was unmasked as a man whose profession of faith was at best superficial, ingenuous, and insincere. And from verse 8 onwards, we are introduced to an incident that flows out of the refusal of three of the Hebrew exiles to bow down and pay homage and honor to the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had raised. At this time, that is at the time of the building of this great statue, some astrologers, Chaldeans really, came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You have issued a decree, O king, that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, O king. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods? Or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. And then with what pride and arrogance in his heart, he speaks these words. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Amen. And we trust that God will bless to us this reading and study of his own inspired, true and inerrant word. We turn again this evening in the Word of God to the third chapter of the book of Daniel. And this evening, our concern is to look together at verses 8 to 15. We've been seeing in our studies in these early chapters of Daniel that two great truths are being set before us. Truths which continue to weave their way throughout the whole of this most remarkable Old Testament book. Truths which are to the believer the most comforting and reassuring of all truths. There is on the one hand the truth of God's sovereign lordship over all the earth. We were reminded of that very signally in chapter 2 when Daniel prays to the God of heaven in these words. You are the one who changes times and seasons. You set up kings and you depose them. And right from the outset of this book, what is being set before us is this gloriously reassuring and comforting truth that our God is the God who reigns, that our God is the God who orders and ordains all things according to his own plan and purpose. And here is a truth in which to place our lives, that our lives are not at the mercy of circumstance, 
that our lives are not at the mercy of the dictates and decisions of mere men, but that in Christ our lives are at the sovereign mercy of our gracious, loving, heavenly Father. Our God is the God who reigns. But there's a second truth being highlighted for us in these chapters, and a truth like this, it's a truth which we find highlighted for us throughout the remainder of these chapters. And it is this. It is the truth of God's pledged commitment to honor those who honor him. We saw this in chapter 1, we saw it in chapter 2, and we shall see it again in chapter 3. It is a call for us to be men and women and boys and girls who live their lives to honor our God. And as we do so, we have God's scripture promise that those who honor him, <clears throat> he will surely honor. And is it not this truth that keeps our hearts and strengthens our souls as we find ourselves up against it so often. When we look around us and see so little taking the things of God and the gospel with any degree of seriousness, we often retire back to the pledged commitment of God to his people, his promise to maintain and preserve his church upon earth until the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will assuredly honor those who seek to honor him. And it is this latter truth which we see once again being highlighted to us throughout this third chapter. We saw in our study last Sunday evening that Nebuchadnezzar, or so it had seemed towards the end of chapter 2, had made a most remarkable profession of faith. He spoke of the Lord as the God of gods and the Lord of kings and as the revealer of mysteries. But we saw in these opening verses of chapter 3 how time unmasked his superficial profession of faith. How quickly, having praised God in such glowing terms, he returns to idolatry and builds this great golden statue in the plain of Dura, which he commanded all of his peoples to bow down, acknowledge and worship. Time unmasked this man. I wonder if it's ever struck you as it has often struck me how quickly men and women can throw off the effects of God's dealings with them and plunge even more recklessly into sin. I've lost count of the number of people I've visited over the years in New Mills who have said to me, God having drawn near to them at some difficult time in their life perhaps or through some signal providence in their life. They've said to me you know Mr. Hamilton or Ian they've said things will change from me with me from now on. I've seen that I've neglected God up till now but, but I've been brought to see the error of my ways. I remember a woman speaking to me so movingly in hospital saying how God had raised her up and that from now on there would be new beginnings with her. And there were for a week, or perhaps two, or maybe even three, never to be seen again. How quickly people can throw off the effects of God's dealings with them. And so it was with this man Nebuchadnezzar. His actions exposed him, unmasked him, and betrayed him. Until we find in verse 15, him saying with such arrogance and pride to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Here was an unhumbled heart, if ever there was one. Here was a man who had been superficially touched by the visitation of God upon his life, but who at this point was not for turning he was not for changing. And he returns again to what he truly was, an arrogant, proud, God-despising man. But if time unmasked Nebuchadnezzar, it also confirmed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Time revealed Nebuchadnezzar in his true colors, 
And equally so, time confirms and reveals to us the true colors of these three Hebrew exiles. And I want us to consider this evening how it was that their lives were exposed and confirmed by time as being lives of undeviating faithfulness to the Lord they served and to the Lord they loved. Notice, first of all, in these verses that these three Hebrew exiles who had been raised with Daniel to positions of prominence and power were confronted with great pressure to conform to the way things were. And you see this very graphically put to us in verses 8 to 12. This decree had been made. The image of gold had been erected. But they were refusing to conform. And every pressure was put upon them so that they would conform. And when they would not conform, they were singled out for special attention, no doubt by these jealous Chaldeans in verse 8, whose noses had been put out by the newfound prominence of Daniel and these Jewish exiles. And they were seized upon for their non-conformity. And increasing pressure was put upon them to fall into step. But before we look at the pressures that were put upon them, notice just in passing here that Daniel's name is nowhere to be found. And we need, I think, to ask ourselves, well, why do they focus their attention on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, why not go for Daniel? But you see, that's not how the world works. These men looked for the more vulnerable. And they seized the more vulnerable. Daniel was not as vulnerable as these three other exiles. Daniel had been raised to this great position of prominence and authority in Babylon. Clearly these men had planned their way well. Let's seize upon the more vulnerable Hebrew exiles. They chose their prey the more carefully. That's why, my brothers and sisters in Christ, we must learn to encourage one another. We must learn to pray for one another. And we must learn to stand with one another in our troubles and trials. We must not allow one another to be confronted by pressures that can by themselves cause us to cave in. We must learn to be there for one another. We must learn that where others are vulnerable to draw near to them, to shield them by our prayers, to support them by our presence. These men there, therefore, were confronted with great pressure. Notice the kind of pressure that they were under. First of all, there was the pressure that everyone else seemed to be conforming to the king's edict. Look at verse 7. We're told that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language were falling down and worshipping the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Everyone else was falling into step. Everyone else was towing the line. Everyone else was doing what was asked of them. And surely no one likes to be the odd one out. You would have to be somewhat deranged in your thinking to enjoy being thought an oddity. No one enjoys going against the tide. And when everyone else, or so it might seem, isn't that the way the world works? Everybody else is doing it. Maybe it was a great encouragement to these men to know there's a man called Daniel who's not doing it. And there are times when the world would seek to overwhelm us with this. Everybody else is doing it. What makes you so different? What makes you think you're right and the world is wrong? And what a great encouragement it can be to know there's another brother who's standing. There's another sister there who's not bowed the knee, but who is seeking by the grace of God to stand for Christ in their day and generation. But when everyone else seems 
to be going the way everyone else is going. It's far from easy to stand your ground. The emotional and the psychological pressure to conform can be insistent and insidious. You don't want to antagonize people. You don't want to lose precious friendships. And the pressure that everybody else is going the way can be for many people a pressure they find hard to resist. My dear friends, this has ever been the reality that faithful believers have experienced throughout the ages. And it may be there are some of us here tonight who are, who are feeling the pressure. The pressure of keeping their head down. The pressure of saying nothing. The pressure to go with the flow. The pressure to not stand against the tide. Are we praying for one another? Are we standing with one another? Are we learning to so enter into one another's situations that we can say, Brother, I know you're up against it. I want to tell you that with God's grace, I'm with you. We will stand together and we will fall together, but we will go on together. Are we there for one another? There was the pressure that everybody seemed to be doing it. There was secondly this pressure that death awaited those who refused to conform. We saw that in verse 6. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. And we see it again in, in verse uh, 15, is it? If you do not worship it, you will be immediately thrown into a blazing furnace. These three young men knew that failure to adapt to the way things were would almost certainly mean death. It wasn't that they would be ostracized by the folk in the office. It wasn't that they would be sneered at. It was that they would face the most horrific of deaths. And surely if anything would reveal our true colors, this surely would. Can you imagine being confronted with this choice? You will bow down. You will go the way that I command. You will do what everybody else is doing. Or you will die the most painful and excruciating of deaths. The cost of remaining true to their convictions. The cost of remaining faithful to the God of their salvation was incalculable. And we know there are Christian believers in the world today who are faced with that pressure. Faced almost daily with the choice, what matters more to me? Remaining faithful to the God of my salvation? Or remaining alive? There was the pressure of death. How would they face up? To that pressure. And thirdly, would it be fanciful to suggest there was a third pressure to conform? If we know anything about human nature, we can almost certainly say there would have been this third pressure. A pressure from within the Jewish exiled community itself. You see, up till this point, because of Daniel's faithfulness and their faithfulness in earlier days, things had gone tolerably well for the Jewish exiles thus far. And would there not be then pressure on Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego to bend a little in the interests of the greater good? Moreover, they were in positions of great usefulness. They were able to influence things. They were administrators in the province. They could keep help their people. And one reckless act could undo all the good that would have been done. Don't you think you ought to bend just a little? You don't need to bend inwardly, just bend outwardly. You don't need to conform in your heart, just give the impression of conforming. Because if you don't, it may not go well with us. That kind of reasoning is subtle. 
That kind of reasoning can be powerful to many. But at heart, it is fundamentally flawed. Because what it is saying, stripped of all its speciousness, is this. Let us do evil that good may come. Let us do evil that good may come. There were pressures, great pressures on these men. And we all know it's one thing to go on faithfully and obediently when all is well. And it's another thing to do so when our lives are being put on the line. And surely we can say that pressure to fit in with the way things are is as real today as it was for them 50 to two and a half thousand years ago. Do we not face the same pressures to fit in with the way things are? The pressure to adopt the world's morality. The pressure to accept the world's theology. We're all going the same way. The pressure to live by the world's attitude to family life. Which by and large leaves children to make their own way to hell. The pressure to conform to the expectations and goals of earth-bound men and women. And that pressure confronts us daily through the media, through the office chatter, through the workplace environment, through the pressure of our peers, the pressure to simply go with the flow, the pressure simply to abandon God and Christ and truth and righteousness because it would be so much easier just to go through a day when nobody sneered at you, when nobody laughed at you, when nobody thought you a prehistoric relic, when nobody looked at you with disdain. You see, at heart, life is about living one of two ways. There are only two ways to live. I want to press this home to your consciences tonight. There are only two ways to live. There is the way of faith, which is the way of undeviating obedience. Brothers and sisters in Christ, how else can a saved, forgiven, and adopted sinner live? Is there any other choice For us, redeemed by the precious blood of the Son of God, there is the way of faith and there is the way of self-interest. Only one of those ways leads to life and the other leads to death. Let me ask you tonight, which way are you on? Which way have you marked out for yourself, for your family? Which way are you resolved by God's grace to go? You might say, Ian, if you only knew the pressures. I'm aware that in some sense I'm shielded from many of the pressures that many of you face day after day. Although for many years I faced those same pressures. There are other kinds of pressures, perhaps for someone like me. I don't know. But whatever pressures you're under, I would say this to you. If you are a forgiven, saved sinner, if you owe your eternal good to God in Christ, for you there is but one way to live. The second thing I want us to notice here is how these men resisted the pressure to conform and how they continued to live faithful and obedient lives in spite of the pressures, in spite of the threats. You'll notice in verse 12 that these Chaldeans come to the king and say, but there are some Jews who pay no attention to you, 
who continue to pay no attention to you. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you've set up. Confronted with the image, confronted with the pressures, Nebuchadnezzar, there are still people who are refusing to toe the line. In spite of all the pressure, these three young men had resolved to be non-conformists. Do you notice here that they made no song and dance about their stand? We're not told that they were trumpeting their non-conformity. They were just continuing to live as they had always done. They did not need to say where they stood. Their lives betrayed where they stood. And so folk could come and point the finger. We have some men who are refusing to do what you command. Who are not bowing down. Whose lives betray them as non-conformists. They did not need to say where they stood. They just continued to live as they had always done. I'm sure to us these young men were exhibiting extraordinary faith. What faith, we say, in the face of such pressures? What faith in the face of such a death? But would they have thought they were exhibiting extraordinary faith? Would they not rather have said to us, how else could we live? We are only doing what God calls us to do. We're not rising to any great heights. How else could a believer live in this world? You see, as we saw in chapter 1, these young men had been captured by a higher and more ultimate reality. They were servants of the living God. They were his chosen people his dearly loved, heaven-bound servants. They were the servants of the King of Kings. And they would bow before one king, King Jehovah, and would pay no homage to any other. Maybe we think, I could never rise to such heights. These young men lived in the dispensation before Christ. These men lived in a day when the spirit of the living God was not known as he is known now. These men lived in a day when the power of God through the the resurrection of Christ had not been let loose in the hearts and lives of believers. Surely in this day, By the help of the Spirit of Christ. By the indwelling presence of our God. We too can have the grace to stand. And having done all things to stand. We too can say with Paul, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Not because in myself I have deep resources. But because God has come to me by his spirit and given me his grace I want simply to notice two things here about the resolve of these young men very clearly and very obviously we are being told here that they valued the honor of their sovereign God more than preserving their own lives it mattered more to them that they could be faithful to their God and Savior than it did for them even to preserve their lives. They were acting here in the same spirit of Paul in Philippians 3 when he wrote, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish. 
literally he says, I consider everything in this world dung that I may gain Christ. And they were acting in the same spirit as Moses. Hebrews 11, 25. Moses chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. These men so valued the honor of their God that nothing would make them bend or bow to a godless world. Their faithfulness, it seems to me, then has its roots deeply embedded in the soil of spiritual truth. What makes men like this? What makes us into men and women who stand so immovably, so unshakably for truth and for righteousness? It's having our lives deeply rooted in the soil of spiritual truth, in the truth of God's uniqueness and glory, in the truth that God will reward the faithful. Above all, in the glorious truth of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's as we make roots down into the deep soil of spiritual truth that we find flowing into our lives the grace and the courage, albeit tremblingly so, to say, here I stand, so help me God. I can do no other. And the second thing we note just as we close this evening is this. Notice that it was how they lived that marked them out as obedient servants of the God of Israel. It was their refusal, obviously and publicly, to fall into step that marked them out that made them an easy prey. Their lives marked them out as men who would not bow the knee. I want us simply as we close this evening to ask ourselves this question. How much does your life and how much does my life give us away? What are people able to deduce from the way you live and from the way I live about who we are and what we are, where we're going, what our convictions are? Can people see by the way we live that we prize the Lord Jesus Christ above everything else in this life? Can people see by the way we live rather than by the words we speak that our citizenship is in heaven. That here we have no continuing city. That we are looking for the city which is to come, whose builder and maker is God. Can people look on and see by the way we live that God's commandments are our happy choice? Can they see by how we live that like Paul, we glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were odd men out. But they were naturally odd men out. They weren't putting on a performance for a time. This was the natural overflow of their lives. There was no other way these men could live they were naturally, by their redeemed natures, odd men out. And because of that, it was inevitable that they would find themselves confronted by a godless world. 
You see, there's only one way for Christian believers not to experience the hostility of a godless world. Simply live as everybody else lives. Speak the way everyone else speaks. Be shaped and styled in your life by the same values and goals as everyone else. In other words, learn to compromise. Prefer an easy life to following Christ faithfully. But is that ever an option for a child of God? Is that ever an option for those redeemed by the precious blood of Christ? Is that ever a conceivable possibility for those to whom the great God of glory has come in selfless love to redeem us from a lost eternity and to bring us into heavenly glory. Is it conceivable? Is it possible that we could ever not want to live unshakably and faithfully for the Savior to whom we owe everything? Let me say again, just as we close, this is not where the Christian life is to end. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is where the Christian life is to begin. And God has promised us the grace to enable us to stand, and having done all to stand, but that will depend, that will depend on how you see your indebtedness to the Lord Jesus Christ. May God give us the conviction of these men so that for us also there will be but one way to live. The way that lives of the glory of our Redeemer. That will bring him glory. And that will lead us to glory. May God persuade us to be such a people. Amen.